Welcome all together. This is the first episode in a two-part series. Uh, so if you notice here on our Norse calendar, this is the time of year starting in the fall, uh, where not just in modern times, but in ancient times too, starting in the late summer um, to into the fall, this is when the harvests came and sports really started to come into ancient cultures. All ancient cultures had some type of sports and games. As this channel is about the Norse culture and beliefs, we will focus on sports in the Viking Age and before. Uh, problem is, guys, there is just not a lot of written sources from the time about this. Um, so we know they played sports, we know which ones. The sources do um, include a lot of that, which I'm covering in this video. What the sources do not cover, however, is the details. They don't go into detail about the rules, the procedures, the organized competitions, the training regimens, and you know, the deeper cultural and spiritual acts, uh, aspects to it, okay? The Greek sources fortunately do go into all of those things that are missing in the Norse, and it's so important, guys, to compare religions like the Greek and the Norse, uh, so those sources can fill in the blanks of each other because the two cultures were really incredibly similar depending on the time period as I have been speaking about in my latest videos on the channel. Uh, but that's what we're going to speak about today. Uh, this video we're going to speak about sources, about sports from the Viking Age, and in part two that I will be releasing next week, that's when we're comparing the Greek sports and the Olympics while showing you some of these epic locations that I visited. <laughs> So first we can speak about the Old Norse language and the terms for sports. Um, generally, we have most mentions of the verb laika, meaning to play, and the noun meaning uh, laikir, so the, the, the games or sports. Uh, we have compound words like leikskali, um, like game house. We have leikmut, which is like a game uh, meeting, like a game tournament or festival, as it's referred to in the sagas. We also have things like leikbuid, uh, the game board. So that's just to show some of the places and locations that, um, that these sports might be taking place. Uh, we also have words like skemdun, which means entertainment, okay? And games were referred to as skemdun in quite a few sources. We have swimming referred to in Lakstarla saga as entertainment skemdun. Uh, in Grettir saga, we have uh, wrestling referred to as skemdun. So this shows that to at least some degree that sports were done not just for fun and status for the competitors, but it was also a culture of um, spectator sports there to entertain people, to, to, to watch at these big gatherings, even though there are basically no records of these types of big events and gatherings in the Norse sources, uh, but we know that there were just because of the linguistic connection to sports and entertainment. At least to some degree it was a spectator sport. But like I said, in the Norse sources, sports are not mentioned in much detail, but they are mentioned very often. Um, here is just a quick list of the sports that are attested in the sagas. Skiing, rowing, horseback riding, wrestling, running, foot braces, archery, spear throwing, swimming, and even things like lifting heavy stones or logs, just to name a few sports. Uh, so most of you know uh, all of those and what they are, but there are a few sports that the Vikings had that you may not have heard of. There is something called Hestavik, uh, horse fighting, which we have a few mentions of in the sagas where they would basically egg horses on into fighting each other. Uh, it was not super common, but it was definitely done. Um, we have something called Nuttukast, which was a bone-throwing game after uh, a feast they had in the Golden Hall or something, whatever, in the Chieftain's Hall. They would basically throw the bones of the uh, food that they had been eating at each other uh, in the hall. Um, we have another sport called uh, Skinlaikir, uh, also referred to sometimes as Horina Skinlaikir. Um, it was a game uh, played by you rolled up an animal fur. And it was basically a game of keep away, four people standing uh, around and one guy in the middle trying to get it and the, the four guys on the outside would throw each other and it could get a little bit rowdy uh, and it also and it seems to have been popular among the Finns of Björnmerland uh, according to Saxo Grammaticus. Um, 
Also, uh, very much regarded as an important game. It was called Flitting. Most of you guys know what this is. It's basically a rap battle where you would sing in rhyme, talking shit about the other side, going back and forth. Most famously uh, done in Lukasenna, but it's, it's mentioned quite a few other times in the sagas. Um, we have um, some more stationary, less physical games that you might not have heard of. Uh, one is called Neftatafel, uh, which was a board game. You have probably seen these for sale online and in museums maybe. The rules of it are not quite clear, but somehow the player in the middle had to get the king to the outside of the board uh, while the opponent tried to take him. Uh, Nefnatafil is one of the few games actually where women and children could play it too, whereas other sports we don't see women and children uh, involved in them. Uh, but there are these two sagas here of uh, children and women playing Hefnatafil. Uh, they did play chess too from the Viking Age, and this was a clear distinction from Ethnothafil because uh, chess, uh, refer or skak in Old Norse, it's mentioned in uh, Krukaref saga where a man named Baridid gave uh, King Harald a game board with Ethnothafil on one side and the chess board on the other side. Um, so there was a clear distinction, um, and they had knowledge of both of those two. So those are the sports and or games. Um, a lot of you, me included, are the most interesting in the types of training they had. What were some Viking training methods that they used to be good at this sport, develop their physical abilities, all those kinds of things? It's just not there, guys. Nowhere in the sources is it is anything like that. I wish more than anything it was, but this is just not something that the people of the time uh, would be writing down in their sources. Did they train? Yes, of course they did. This is not rocket science. Any living creature with a functioning brain can figure out, okay, I am not very good at this thing. Let's practice it a bit more so I can get better. Of course they had training. Of course they had knowledge of physical training. It's just the sources don't go into it so much as to what they did. So it's very different to the vast amount of the sources on the ancient Greeks actually and how they trained for their Olympics because we have quite a few records of that. But in all the sagas I've read, which is basically all of them, I'm only aware of one example where training is actually mentioned for sports. Um, in Magnuson's saga, the king basically um, talks shit to his son after he lost a foot race. He says, don't you know other people in other lands train themselves in other sports? Uh, they call them ithrotir, um, something besides filling their drink and making themselves senseless and unfit. So he's, he's, he's admitting that other uh, 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 lands train themselves in sports. Um, and that was after his son uh, had lost a foot race. Um, and his son was basically just a drunk and didn't train at all. So that's about the only evidence we have that they trained uh, in sports. Basically, every single other attestation... When someone was good at a sport, it is referred to as like a natural born gift that certain people had from a very early age. In the sagas, especially the ones describing uh, chieftains, kings, and other heroes, it's almost an obligatory part of the beginning of the story when a character is introduced that it is mentioned how they their appearances and all the sports that they were good at, all the way from young age into adulthood. Also, in almost every description of the main character in whatever saga there was, his build was mentioned. Was he tall? Was he short? Was he average height? Was he big? Was he strong? Was he long-legged? And many of these physical characteristics are even incorporated into the nicknames of the character. We have Halfdan Long Leg, we have Grettir the Strong, we have Skalla Grim, which was uh, Grim, the bald headed one, we have Olav Digre, Digre meaning massive, which was King Olav the Saint, who was said to be just average height, but a massive specimen, very broad and very uh, muscular. You even have Rollo, who um, uh, has said his name was uh, Gungirulf, uh, so Rolf the Walker, and he was called that because he was so big that no horse would carry him, so he had to walk. And accompanying whenever a description is given about the physical appearance of a uh, uh, character from the sagas, um, it almost always lists what sports they were good at as well. 
in Grettir's saga, for example, Grettir was a very good wrestler, swimmer, and a strong man. In uh, Thordur Fagari, um, in Svartdala saga, there was a man named uh, yeah, Thordur Fagari, um, like I said, and that was Thordur uh, the wrestler. Um, maybe one of the most well-known athletes of the sagas was uh, Olav Trygvas. And like I said, every uh, character in the sagas pretty much was good at some sports, and those sports are all listed. But one of probably the most athletic individual of the Viking Age was Olav Tryggvason. He was said to be great at swimming, horseback riding, skiing, among other sports. He could run along the oars of the ship, like you may have seen in this movie right here. And he was said to be great at throwing spears, which he could throw one spear with each hand and letting them go at the same time. Another uh, uh, great athlete of the Viking Age was Harald Hydrada, who was said to be uh, great at many sports. He was, and he was tall, by the way. He was well over six foot and, and very strong and good looking and good at all, all variety of sports. But he was very famous when he was serving in the Varangian Guard in uh, uh, Constantinople area as a commander in the, in, in the military. Harald was said to take breaks in the middle of sieges and battles so that he and his men could play sports in between battles. So I think this is, this is really uh, the most uh, uh, beneficial lesson that we can uh, take today. So cross training, okay? It's not just about being a good warrior or being good at any single sport. To be a successful warrior, you need to be good at a variety of physical activities. I know, for example, my fighting, I do the best at times when I am cross-training a lot more and playing different kinds of sports. And this was very much the view uh, in the Viking Age as well, that you had to be a well-rounded athlete to be successful and also respected among your uh, peers. Also note that another beautiful thing about Norse culture in general Sports and physical uh, prowess was very much tied to status and honor. It wasn't like a lot of other cultures at the time, uh, where sports, um, uh, the participants were basically of the lower class in society, and then it was some fat-ass, lazy, upper-class people's entertainment to watch them, just like it was done in ancient Rome, for example, or hey, even today, okay? No, in Norse culture, completely opposite. Um, and, and also, at the peak of Greek culture, it was the same thing. It was the highest class, wealthiest, most noble people who were the best at sports. It wasn't like sports were a peasant thing as entertainment for the upper class, no. If you were in the upper class in the Viking world, you had to be good at sports. People would just not respect you if you were not. And I think that's just a really beautiful and absolutely necessary for a healthy society that the high-class leaders should be physically capable themselves. This is, goes back to all the ancient Greek uh, philosophers. Uh, they had the same opinion on this. And your reputation was often tied to what athletic abilities you had uh, during the Viking Age. Um, so when a guest came before a king in some sources, uh, the king would often ask, what sports accomplishments um, that the new person had. So they knew like where to place them in their hall, like you, how, how good, uh, how much of an athlete you were, that would gain you higher status and maybe have you uh, uh, able to sit closer to the king as a higher standing in the hall. Another famous example of this exact same thing happening is when uh, Thor and Loki and their servants came to the giant uh, Uthgarda Loki in his hall and they were asked what accomplishments, um, and again there's this word uh, Ithrut, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's kind of related to the modern Norwegian word Idret, uh, that's where it comes from, it's, it's sports but it's more like accomplishments as well um, and very much tied to their reputation in, in Old Norse. And Thor and Loki were asked to prove their Ithrot um, through the games that f followed in, uh, in, in the following uh, uh, parts of that story. You know, Thor and his wrestling, Loki and his eating, uh, and then their running and all that stuff. Another example of the same type of thing. Uh, in Laxdala Saga, there was a sport of swimming that was common in the Viking Age where you basically had to try and drown the other guy by holding him under the water as long as you could. 
This is also mentioned in other sources like Magnusona Saga, but in Laxdala Saga specifically, there was a young man, uh, the, the, the main character of the saga, named Kjartan, and he looked out in the river, in the fjord, and he saw a very strong swimmer, and he decided to go out there and swim them, and, and prove he was a better swimmer, and he tried to drown the uh, good swimmer. It wasn't until after that Kjartan uh, discovered that the man he tried to drown was King Olav Tryggvason, and he thought, oh shit, this is the king who had been going around torturing people in the whole country to death if they wanted to remain pagan. Uh, so he said, oh shit, I really messed up there, I better run. <laughs> but King Olav was actually impressed by Kjartan as a physical specimen, and he wanted to bring him in among his men and to his close guard. So if you were good at sports like that and you impressed some um, uh, high-ranking people, it, it, it would mean it would be very much tied to your honor and your reputation. So that's the kind of thing we can learn about sports from the Viking Age, even though the detailed accounts of sports are very scarce. Uh, but before I finish, let's go over some of the detailed mentions of sports, including how they were played. By far, the one that is mentioned most in the sagas, hundreds of times, is. Glima, wrestling. This is the inspiration for my clothing line. Uh, Glima does not appear to be super technical as it is with modern wrestling or BJJ or other martial arts. Wrestling in the Viking Age was primarily a gauge of strength. For example, in Grettir's saga, Grettir was thought to be strong. Everybody knew him as a strong guy, but no one knew exactly how strong he was because no one had seen him wrestle yet in that story. So you needed to prove yourself as a wrestler if you were going to be able to call yourself a strong man. Another one in Finnboga saga, when Thorgeid asked Finnbogi to perform a feat of strength, Finnbogi asked if he wanted to see him wrestle. So there you go. You could basically not call yourself a strong man unless you could wrestle. I completely agree. You see a lot of these big bodybuilders guys, they can lift a bunch of weight, but if you ask them to wrestle for 30 seconds, they're dead. <laughs> so completely worthless muscles. Um, you all know the famous story of when Thor was in uh, Utgarda. Uh, Utgarda Loki's hall and he wrestled the old woman and he was brought to his knee because the old woman was a personification of old age um, and that is that is how that story goes as well. Also in that same story Thor tried to lift up a cat but he couldn't do it uh, because the cat was actually the Jörmungandir. Um, apart from wrestling uh, there are another um, there are other feats of strength, um, including lifting heavy things that are mentioned in the sagas. Um, like I said, in, in Finnboga saga, Finnbogi uh, lifted a heavy stone to demonstrate his power to Thorgeid. In Grettir's saga, he also lifted a big heavy stone so that everyone saw it. They were just blown away how strong he was. The most legendary feat of strength, though, was by a man in the Viking Age named Orm Storjofsson, who lifted up a mast of a ship on his shoulders, and he walked three steps with it before he broke his back. Um, so it's it's those types of things that get interesting because we know what the masts of a, the regular ship were in the Viking Age, um, and it was supposed to weigh 650 kilos. So super incredible. It was a few years ago that Hafthor Julius Björnsson actually broke this 1,000 year old record and he walked five steps with it. Uh, that was with a lifting belt though and suit and a lot of, we'll call them modern Mexican supplements and secret juices that we have access to today. So think back to a thousand years ago for a man to do this lift, this ship mast and, and walk some steps with it. That would be a godlike feat of strength. Uh, finishing up on uh, wrestling, like other sports, uh, it would be primarily practiced at the All Thing or the other annual uh, festivals. Uh, there was a place in Iceland called Fangabeka, which meant the wrestling slopes, and that was at Tingveller, uh, that's, that's in Viga Grim Saga. So it's those kinds of places where um, uh, sports, we can see sports, just like the Greeks, um, it was tied to these kind of high festivals, at least to a certain degree. Definitely not as organized, but uh, kind of something that people would do at the times of year where everyone would get together. Uh, let's move on to the last sport, and this is probably the most famous one from the Viking Age. It's called Knatleikur. It was some sort of ball game. 
the best descriptions of it come in these sources here. Um, we're actually not sure about the rules completely, but we know the general idea of how it was played. It was played by two teams wielding wooden bat type of things, like a stick, and they were playing it on a field with a hard ball. And it would have probably been very similar to hockey or lacrosse, and it could get uh, quite rowdy apparently. And it apparently took so much time that the game lasted from morning until evening, so it was played all day. In a couple sources, this game was actually played on ice. In uh, Toyosfirdinga Saga and uh, Gulitoria Saga, it was played on ice, so it would probably be very, very similar to our hockey there. But all the other times Knatleikur is mentioned, um, it's played either in the summer or the season where there would have been no ice, so it would have been on a regular field. So uh, um, Also, from the sources, it seems like the ball could be carried or uh, bounced, but primarily you would be hitting it with a stick to get it wherever the goal was. We also think the ball was quite hard. It wasn't a soft, pleasant ball. It was a hard, dangerous ball, because in Gretti's saga, a man named Eudin was hit in the face with the ball, and he started bleeding. So it was probably pretty hard there uh, and heavy. Uh, but there also was a fair bit of sportsmanship to be expected in Knatleikr. Uh, in Egil's saga, the young child Egil was knocked to the ground by a bigger, stronger boy while they were playing Knatleikr, and this was a big offense um, and, and viewed as very, very unsportsmanlike. So much that Egil actually came back uh, with an axe and killed him <laughs> later in the day. Uh, so there would have been some gentlemanly nature to the game and a big offense if the honor was not kept. Um, probably probably something like uh, rugby. A little bit rough, but if you get a, a too rough unnecessarily, it would, be, it, it would get bloody and it would develop into a fight. Uh, the game was still quite rough though. Uh, rough enough so that a more elderly man in one saga, in Thoida saga, um, he said he would not participate because he was too old for those games. Even though Thoida was... Uh, still young enough to take up arms and he went into battle um so so just a note there um sports mainly for the younger people but elderly people even if they could still fight they maybe wouldn't play uh, sports final source there was a law about leaving the game of knut like good um since uh, a man could leave the game at any time he pleases he himself uh, was responsible for any injuries that he might have suffered during the game. That's according to the Gyorgos Law Code. So it seems like you could leave the game at any time you wanted and you wouldn't lose any honor over it. Unlike Hongang, for example, the, the dueling, where if you left the ring during the fight, it was the worst thing you can do, worse than death, uh, for your honor. So see my video on the sources about Hongang. Final part. Here we have to speak about the occasions because this is very important and I'm going to come back to this um, uh, when I go over the Greek sources as well. Unlike the Greek Olympics, sports in the Norse world seem to be very spontaneous and they were practiced anywhere, uh, anytime without you know a big event having to take place. But there were definitely events where sports um, were expected to take place at, uh, at, at these high festivals. Uh, in the Eribigya saga, the people of a place called Breidavik, they held a game festival around the Vetternatr, the winter nights, which was just last week um, in our Norse calendar. Uh, people stayed for two weeks or more. And they lived in uh, like solid, uh, so like game halls. They they, they stayed overnight um, for for a couple weeks, and that's one example where we see of organized, planned sporting events uh, coming at the biggest high festival of the year. Uh, competitions uh, took place at the uh, 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 game festivals in Bayadar Saga also. Also in Gretis Saga, um, uh, they took place at the Spring Assembly at a place called He Granesting. Uh, so, um, that's all we have to say about uh, where the sports were taking place. Like I said, not, uh, not a whole lot of info other than that. So to sum it up, end of the video, there are two things um, we can say that were vastly different about Greek and Norse sports. First, the Norse games were very impromptu. Apart from the last couple of examples that I mentioned, organized sports, um, you know, were not planned ahead of time, really. They were just maybe getting together and they decided to play some sports to pass the time. 
and it doesn't appear that people train for them either for specific events. Um, very, very different than the Greek Olympics. Uh, number two biggest difference in the Norse world, sports don't appear to have any connection to the gods or the divine, which absolutely was a major part of the Greek athletic events. The, 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 the Greek Olympics and the other athletic events uh, were very spiritual and connected to the gods and the divine and were oftentimes, you know, a lot of these stadiums in the Greek world uh, are right next to the biggest temples of the time. Uh, however, I think the Norse also did have this concept that they, they, there was some connection between sports and the gods and the divine or a higher power, whatever. And I think this for a few reasons that I am going to go into in the next video. So stay tuned, that will be released next week. But uh, that's all for today. We'll see you next time.